I'm talking to you from Bidjigal land on the Cooks River, on which uh, sovereignty was never ceded. And I did just want to make one point about that. Uh, the idea that China is threatening Australian sovereignty is one of the major claims driving discussion today. And not only is that a dangerous exaggeration, but it also obscures the essentially conflicted nature of sovereignty in Australia today and normalizes white Australia's claim to this land. And that's not something I think that progressives should go along with. As Anne said, this is a very timely discussion given events of the past week. It's also a complicated discussion. On China, I see three spheres of debate in which the left needs to be articulating a position. First is the geopolitical foreign policy discussion. The second is anti-racism and the rise of xenophobia. And the third is the question of solidarity with people in China. And I think we probably all have some notion of what the basic elements of a progressive position then should look like. So opposition to a drive towards confrontation and the risk of war that that entails uncompromising opposition to racism and internationalist support for people fighting for their rights or suffering repression in China. Mm -hmm. When I say we need to articulate a position on these things, though, I don't just mean saying things. I also mean articulating in its second sense of linking, how we link these issues so that we see our commitments on each one as complementary, not contradictory. Because the right, of course, has its way of articulating these, these issues. They'll argue, for example, that if you support human rights in China, you should also support the West's get tough on China measures. They believe that talk of racism is a smokescreen intended to divert from that mission. And then in the middle, you have people who are liable to be drawn in either direction. So most Australians have a pretty healthy skepticism of America's intentions, but they're also justifiably worried about things they see coming out of China. They're looking for some direction here, which is what a party like the Greens has to provide. And we're now in the midst of this dangerous tit for tat cycle of spats in realms of trade and diplomacy. And in this situation, it, it can become hard to see the wood for the trees. So I wanna step back and ask how things reach this point. I wanna argue that there are deep geopolitical forces driving this crisis. It's not simply a case of bad policy making. It's not driven by Cold War paranoia, although we do see plenty of that. Uh, and it's not also motivated by racism, although racism is certainly a feature of the wider context. Um, so on that basis, the idea that with some policy shifts, Australia can go back to a more stable status quo in which it's friends with both America and China that it can balance, uh, to use the conventional language, uh, its economic and defense interests. This is something that I'm skeptical of. I think the left has to start putting forward more radical solutions to this crisis. I'll start then by talking about Australia as a sub-imperial country. Uh, ever since its colonization, Australians have tried to act on the world in collaboration with a more powerful patron. Uh, formerly, Australia only had its own foreign policy beginning in the interwar period. But before then, we lobbied Britain to take more notice of Australian interests in its policies, to incorporate more of the Pacific into the empire, to be less friendly to Japan, and then during World War II, to put more energy into the Pacific sphere, uh, and so on. Uh, after World War II, Australia gradually, gradually shifted towards a reliance on the US, with Vietnam being the clincher. So Vietnam, from the Australian point of view, was conceived of as a way to anchor an American presence in Southeast Asia where we needed it. Importantly, this is not the logic of a lapdog. Australian foreign policy elites think for themselves and they've independently and almost unanimously come to the view that America's presence in Asia is indispensable for what they deem to be Australia's interests. And that remains the orthodoxy to this day. So then what are those interests? I think it's fair to say foreign policy is probably the least democratic sphere of policy making that, that it, there is. Uh, it's informed by elite networks with interests abroad. Uh, Australian business wants a profitable investment environment. Uh, voices from security and defense prioritize strategic postures, political alignments. Uh, and sometimes those objectives are in harmony uh, and sometimes they're not. Uh, and in the case of China right now, they're clearly not. And there's a tension that's been growing at the elite level uh, for some time now. Uh, Australia took a hostile view of China, of course, during the Cold War, uh, and then flipped in the 1970s and entered a period of what we call engagement. 
This brought a huge increase in trade and exchange with China, uh, and it gave China a path out of uh, its autarky at the cost of making itself the world's sweatshop. Today, engagement is what we've been told is at an end. Uh, in America now, China wonks talk about great power competition, or GPC, as they call it. Uh, and it's a significant shift. But it's important to realize that from the West's point of view, engagement was never an open-ended friendship. It was always conditional, conditional on China conforming to a place in the world system that America and its allies were comfortable with. So the high point of engagement in the 1990s was also the high point of American unipolar hegemony. There was a decade of the Soviet Union's demise, which China uh, naturally saw as a major negative example. So China therefore remained wary of the West. Uh, they continued to build up their military, they refused to fully privatize their state sector, uh, and they became more repressive domestically in that decade too. All along, um, of course, China naturally had ambitions to escape its subordinate position in the global uh, economy by gradually building up its domestic market, cultivating champion corporations uh, to the point where we now have um, you know, major tech giants like Huawei today. So there were always tensions uh, in this situation. And with hindsight, I think we can now say that the slide towards rupture and confrontation was set in motion after the 2009 financial crisis. <clears throat> with all the talk these days of CCP interference and influence, it's important for us to grasp that China has never really been all that invested in directly lobbying the West. It's mostly relied on the goodwill of the corporate world to influence Western policy. After the crisis in 2009, uh, Beijing's stimulus helped Chinese corporations to squeeze out foreign competitors in China. Uh, state banks issued credit to boost production in a range of sectors, which led to overcapacity uh, and a turn outwards, what became known as the, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And of course, with that increasing competition uh, with, the, uh, with the West. This led to a souring towards China in corporate America and left the way open for a more hawkish security perspective to take hold. So then Obama launched his pivot to Asia, which has resulted in a very significant naval buildup in, in Asia, as well as that increased uh, American presence, American troop presence uh, in Australia. <clears throat> At the same time, it didn't stop China from, from continuing its own efforts to uh, exert control of its immediate periphery and to test the strength of the US alliance system, particularly in the South China Sea, where China feels itself most vulnerable to blockade or, or military assault. Um, and these Chinese moves are obviously aggressive and destabilizing, but then so too, of course, is America's war gaming uh, in the region. Now, Australia's perspective on all this is a, a little bit different. Um, Australian companies have been burnt in China. Uh, in the same way that some American companies have. But on the whole, Australia's economy remains very complementary with China's. We have a huge trade surplus with China. And for all the talk of diversifying international trade, there's considerable skepticism as to the possibility of, of doing that. Corporate Australia still remains quite bullish uh, about China. At the same time, the idea of America stepping back from Asia is almost unthinkable to most foreign policy elites in Australia. It undermines the very foundations of Australian foreign policy. That is to say, it's sub-imperial role that I've described. For America to withdraw would render Australia irrelevant to American interests. Um, we would lose a seat at Washington's table, which is how Australia tries to influence the world. And it would also impede Australia's ability to dominate its immediate region. Now, as long as it seems that America is willing to do the heavy lifting to maintain its position. Australia does prefer to sit back so as to not to damage its trade with China. It's when America seems to be slipping that Australia feels the need to step up and do more. And here I think the election of Trump was important. Trump's rhetoric towards China now, right now, of course, is highly bellicose, um, not to mention racist. But you remember him initially talking a lot about deprioritizing America's alliances, all in the name of America first. And that talk set off alarm bells in Canberra. Uh, 
it was shortly after this that the security agencies turned up their rhetoric against China, um, specifically ASIO's claim that Australia was facing unprecedented foreign interference. This became something of a mantra um, amplified by alarmists like Clive Hamilton. This narrative was directed domestically uh, to lay the groundwork for a more confrontational stance towards Beijing, but it was also exported internationally, supposedly as an example of what China would do uh, if the world didn't unite to stand up uh, against it. Australia has taken the lead in other respects too with its ban on Huawei, um, clearly the product of a coordinated campaign among Five Eyes intelligence partners. Uh, more recently, it's provocative call for an inquiry into the origins of COVID. Uh, Australia has been building a military to fight China alongside the US for two decades now, but the recent arms purchases just made that much more explicit. Um, so really what I'm trying to highlight here is the deeply systemic nature of, of this rivalry and the dangerous dynamics that that gives rise to. That really has to be the starting point for the Australian left on, on China. Um, the corollary to this I'm afraid to say is that there is a logic to the hawkish position. Um, there is only a short space of time before China's rise becomes a fait accompli. Its economic heft will invariably translate into political heft, and that will diminish America's role in Asia. And I think preventing this now is the driving objective of Australia's China policy. And on this, I, I really see no significant difference between Labor and the Liberals. I don't believe that there is consensus yet as to how China might actually be contained um, or that we're on the brink of war, but there is clearly a growing brinksmanship in the stouches that are now occurring with increasing uh, frequency. <laughs> of course, this course that we're now on uh, will damage the um, uh, Australian economy. We're only just starting to feel that. Uh, people's livelihoods will suffer for no good reason. Um, but the left needs to take care to distinguish its position from the, the kind of corporate internationalism that is also part of this debate uh, as well. So we have a critique, of course, of the profit-driven free trade approach to China. The benefits of that have been far from equally distributed. Um, and those of, who advocate for it um, do often slip into apologetics for human rights abuses in China uh, and so on. <laughs> Um, we also need to be aware of the pitfalls of calls for an independent foreign policy. Now, Australia should be independent here in the sense of not taking sides. We should scrap the US alliance uh, as is Green's policy. But <clears throat> in the hands of people like Hugh White, independent foreign policy basically means doing what Australia does now, just without US support. And that's actually a recipe for a more militaristic Australia because it will require increased military spending. Um, so we need to be talking about a more transformative approach to international relations, how we can actually get to a world where big nations don't dominate the small. Um, and if we want to put forward a critique of China's increasingly imperialistic approach to its neighbours, and we should, that has to begin with a critique of Australia's own imperial exploitative relationship to its Pacific neighbours. Um, so I want to wrap up these introductory remarks now, and I've only really had time to address the first of these three spheres of debate that uh, I outlined at the start, um, and I'm happy to take up any of the other issues that are arising in discussion of China these days. I'll just conclude with some points on those other, on those other two. Along with rejecting the in-your-face racism that we've seen during COVID, um, we have to oppose also the idea that people of Chinese ethnicity or of PRC background um, should experience heightened suspicion and scrutiny as to their political allegiances. We also need to insist that having sympathy for China's position on this or that particular issue is not a crime. Um, Australia's new foreign interference legislation is draconian. Uh, the security agencies seem to have been given carte blanche. And this is a threat not just to Chinese Australians, but to everyone's civil liberties uh, in Australia. Uh, where there are issues like corruption in politics or universities compromising on academic freedom, we take a principled stance uh, on those things, not one that singles out China as the sole bad actor. And finally, we need to seek meaningful ways to offer solidarity to people in China. That requires, I believe, um, resisting the framing of these issues in Cold War terms as hallmarks of Chinese authoritarianism versus Western democracy. Islamophobia in Xinjiang, 
police violence and the erosion of democracy uh, in Hong Kong, the repression of trade unionists in China. We view these as part of global struggles that progressives everywhere are engaged in. And we offer those communities here in Australia a progressive platform through which to get their voices out. Right now, the direction of Australian policy is only making it more difficult for us to have any influence on the way China conducts itself domestically, uh, which is all the more reason to uh, oppose it. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm here on the land of the Gadigal people and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I think David's points as to the absolute hypocrisy of white Australia freaking out at um, potential foreign interference by um, other countries when at the same time we have not dealt with the genocide and the invasion of this very country that we sit on um, is beyond belief to me and so many others and I pay absolute respect to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this is and was stolen land. It's 2013 and I head from my Hong Kong apartment to meet my amnesty colleagues in a nondescript meeting room to meet human rights defenders who have come from mainland China to join us for a training session. They risk their freedom by doing this. It's 2017 in Sydney CBD, a group of Falun Gong practitioners are attending a Reclaim Australia rally with some of the attendees holding anti-CCP signs and others with phrases like go home chinks on them. It seems their interests have aligned. In April, the Chinese ambassador to Australia publicly threatens sanctions on wine and then we see trade sanctions and investigations being imposed on Australian wine, barley and beef industries. It's 1901 and white Australia policy is enacted in part in response of resentment of white miners to the success of Chinese miners on the gold fields, further entrenching systemic racism on top of the colonial invasion and genocide inflicted on First Nations people in this country. It's the start of the pandemic and Morrison and Dutton close the borders with China and send people coming from China to Christmas Island to quarantine. Later, as border closes, borders close with other countries, people coming from other countries are put in hotel quarantine in five-star hotels in Sydney and other capital cities. Just this week, an essential poll commissioned by the Asian Australian Alliance found that 31% or nearly one in three respondents believed that Chinese people had brought most cases of the virus to Australia. Just over half believed that it was not true that Chinese people had brought most of those cases. And one in three, sorry, one in five felt that Chinese communities and families were more likely to spread COVID-19. The resonance of Trump's calling this the China virus has infected our own communities. It's Friday the 26th of June and a member of the New South Wales Parliament has their house raided by ASIO. In later reports, it becomes clear that on the same day, a Chinese journalist is also questioned by ASIO. In August this year, Australian news journalist Cheng Lei is arrested in Beijing. She remains in detention and Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Maurice Payne confides in The Guardian this week that Canberra had not been told why Cheng had been detained and the story went on to write that amid deteriorating relationships between countries, Payne is among a number of Australian ministers who have indicated they have been unable to get their Chinese counterparts on the phone. Bill Bertels and Mike Smith returned to Australia after having Australian government consular and diplomatic support due to safety fears. Last year at an Asian Australian leadership summit in Sydney, a mainstream media storm blows up around federal Liberal MP Gladys Liu. While over a tea break, I talk to some young Australian born Chinese graduates who tell me about the barriers to getting promoted in Australian government positions as a result of them being seen as a security risk because they still have family in China. Late last night on the news, we see footage of the so-called leader of the free world saying, and I quote, and we are getting along very well with the Taliban. ABC background briefing reports that the second highest spend on Facebook pro-Trump advertising material during the US election was by Falun Gong connected media outlets. On June 4, every year, Chinese democracy activists and their supporters light candles outside of the consulate in Sydney, in Camperdown. And on many occasions, I have joined them. Earlier this year, when a white man starts cracking a whip next to people waiting at line at, on, in line at that same Chinese consulate in Camperdown, yelling anti-Asian slurs, anti-Chinese slurs, he is then faced with court 
those same Chinese pro-democracy activists are seen standing with white wing, wing nationalist groups in support of the whip cracking man. May 2020, after yellow umbrellas and a popular peaceful uprising successfully delays and garners attention of the world, national security legislation comes into effect in Hong Kong. And weeks later on an activist Zoom call, Hong Kong activists are no longer able to share the details of what's happening with persecution. Last week, One Nation in New South Wales spins to the media an inquiry into tertiary education, so it's positioned as an inquiry into Chinese influence on higher education. Years earlier, the founder of this party warns that Australia is being at risk of being swamped by Asians. Foreign interference laws are continually cited in relation to the likes of the Confucius Institutes across the political spectrum. Strong voices are raised in opposition to these institutes. But meanwhile, US study centers and massive private corporate interests in our tertiary education system are not questioned. The Morrison government chooses to launch the next wave of focus on foreign interference at exactly the same time as everybody is focused on their government's failings in the aged care sector in the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Greens invite me to speak at this forum, one of the few Chinese Australian political representatives in this country to speak on China-Australia relations. And on Twitter, some in our own ranks express outrage at the fact that it is even happening. I wanted to start and begin with those snapshots for two reasons. The first is to demonstrate how insanely difficult and complex this space is, and to show how interconnected the Australian government's approach to foreign policy and our party's approach to geopolitics is and needs to be connected and cannot be separated with what is happening domestically. Second, I wanted to show that it is absolutely <clears throat> crucial that we as a left party are committed to principles of social justice, grassroots democracy, peace and nonviolence, and that how crucial it is that we are able to negotiate the complexities of our relationships with groups and players and commentators and recognize that the serious and pervasive issues of systemic racism, the existence of white savior complexes and an ongoing fear of yellow, yellow peril invasion impacts on one's ability to take a stance on issues relating to China, and we need to call that out. It is absolutely crucial that us as a party is first and foremost anti-racist in an approach for all that we do, and this includes how we talk about and what we do when it comes to international relations. Australia's relationship with China is full of complexity, and David has outlined this in detail. There are so many interconnected elements, including Australia's alliance with the US, the impact that that has on our relationships in the region, challenges in managing the bilateral relationships between a superpower and a middle power, the inherent power on imbalances, China's one party system, so different to our own democracy, the China's appalling human rights record, but let's not let US or Australia off the hook when it comes to human rights records. China's more interventionist policy of late, fears of undue influence in China and the introduction of local domestic foreign interference laws, and the historic and continuing anti-Chinese policy and culture in Australia, including the presence of racism in public discussion around China and the increase of incidents as a result of COVID. It is this interconnectedness of the issues that makes the China-Australia relationship so complex, but it does not mean that we should stay silent on it. And, when we, and it certainly should not mean that we are silenced when we want to speak about these issues and engage in these tough questions. I hope that this discussion starts more conversations in our party and on the left about how we navigate these spaces. Now we know, and it's almost impossible to talk about China-Australia relations without talking about the US alliance. And Australia has long hitched a ride on the US's coattails when it comes to our foreign policy. We have shamely, shamefully followed the US into every single war for decades. We've unnecessarily increased our defense spending by hundreds of billions of dollars at the behest of the US. And this on the anniversary of 9-11, it is worth noting that we saw after this event, the introduction of some seriously draconian anti-terrorism laws in this country, which along with our no war stance, the Greens opposed. And it made me so proud to be part of a party that was able to navigate that space. We were able to engage with the complexity of those issues at that that time, recognising that people were scared and fearful about terrorist acts, but at the same time not staying silent on the use of that fear when it came to draconian governments introducing draconian anti-terrorism laws. And it is my hope that we find a similar way to be able to negotiate that space when it comes to dealing with China, Australia, US, 
and foreign relations issues. The Australian government appears to have uh, been more forthright with China since Donald Trump became president. And I would suggest that, as David mentioned, the clumsy diplomacy on display earlier this year when Australia loudly pursued an investigation into the origins of COVID-19 looked clearly like we were doing Trump's bidding. The Morrison government has continued long-standing Australian foreign policy of copying the US. But I think we all agree that doing this with Trump at the helm makes it even more problematic than before. The Greens view has long been that our alliance with the US means that we are not seen as an independent or honest broker in our region. And that's not to forgive Australia's own recognising David's points about the problematic view of Australia taking an independent foreign policy and what that actually means in practice for our own issues around our interactions in the region. Those who call for the US alliance to act as a hedge against Chinese power in the region fail to acknowledge the realities of what's changing here and that the US is not a reliable partner in any case. Despite the win continued whipping up of fear of invasion and foreign influence, it's important to remember the fact that the chance of an attack from any foreign power is incredibly remote. Now, having an independent approach to international relations also means that in our relationships with China or the US or any other country, we don't have to meekly accept their human rights abuses nor rely just on elite backroom diplomacy. That said, a significant barrier to Australia trying to use our relationships and our positions on international bodies to try and influence to end repression and human rights abuses in other countries is in fact our own very questionable record when it comes to upholding human rights and protecting and not violating human rights in our own country. And while it is absolutely the case that the Chinese government is responsible for significant and grave human rights abuses, it is also true that we should be able to talk about China and Chinese people without having to mention all of this every single time. And we also need to ensure that the act of not mentioning these things does not get positioned as condoning or denying these realities. Just like when we hold a panel on the US elections, we don't condone people for not mentioning the fact that that country still imposes the death penalty on their citizens. It does not mean that we sanction that gross human rights violations just because we have a discussion about American elections that doesn't mention the death penalty. I question why it is then then when we're talking on a panel around China, Australia and Eurasia, relations that some react with horror when we don't mention China's human rights abuses. But at the same time, they make no mention of the requirement for such a panel descriptor to also outline Australia's violations of human rights through mandatory detention, deaths in custody, failure to address violence against women, foreign interference and anti-terrorism laws. I would like to call this out for what it is. And I appreciate that when we call these things out, it is uncomfortable for some people. But this is an example, a clear, clear example of systemic racism and we need as a party to get better to be able to identify and call this out even when it is disguised as a care for human rights or guised in left values. All that said, the Australian government should, of course, use our relationship with China to try to influence the Chinese government policy when it comes to the repression and human rights abuses. We need to show solidarity with people facing oppression at the hands of the Chinese authorities. I know this working firsthand for Amnesty in Sydney, London and Hong Kong, having been connected for decades with those exiled from Tibet, highlighted the persecution of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, worked side by side by democracy activists in Hong Kong and here in Sydney, as well as campaigning for the crackdown on journalists and academics and human rights defenders. But if we are talking about using our international relationships to influence and improve our human rights, we can't just call for this approach when we're dealing with non-Western countries. We also should be using our relationship with the US and the president of that country when he sides with white supremacists. We need to show solidarity with American people, particularly black Americans who are being murdered by the state at the hands of police and a result, as a result of their unjust systems. Something that is made harder in Australia due to the systemic racism in our own police force. Now let's not forget that it is our country that has failed to enshrine human rights protections in national domestic laws. 
There's been a lot of focus of late on undue Chinese influence in Australia's political and education systems, and we can easily protect those systems against undue influence, whether that be from foreign countries or big business. But government refuses to consider those solutions because removing money from politics or properly funding our tertiary education systems is not something that they seem particularly uh, interested in doing. As the Greens have long said, and as we would all know, the best way to counter undue influence of any kind in Australia's political system is to get the money out of politics. We need donations reform, we need donations caps, and we need real-time disclosures. But both the major parties refuse to come to the table on this, in part, I think, because it stops them from being able to whip up the kind of racist fear that helps them look like they're protecting people from some alleged invasion. Now, universities should have enough funding from the Australian government so they don't feel beholden to any foreign government or big business to actually determine their curriculum because they should be funded adequately. They shouldn't be required to re rely on funds from international students as a critical part of their revenue because of the fact that Australian governments fail to fund our tertiary education system properly. Successive governments have starved Australia's tertiary education sector of adequate funding, forcing them to accept neoliberal business models that are proving to be unsustainable in the face of a global pandemic. And that's why we want the Greens, why the Greens want the Australian government to fund universities properly properly and not treat international students like they have been treated as a way of propping up our tertiary education sector to then have people have this turn that that's turned on them when things are going bad in the relations between China and Australia. In relation to the latest Chinese report, the reports of Chinese journalists in Australia being investigated by national security agencies, Chinese academics having their visas cancelled and a New South Wales parliamentarian having his house raided, we need clear transparency from ASIO. The onus has to be on Peter Dutton and the security agencies to explain why have these decisions been made. Now, the Greens have been very critical of Dutton's excessive and growing powers. We have been critical and opposed to these laws when they have been introduced. We believe that these decisions should not be shrouded in secrecy, but we also need to be more vocal about the racist undertones of such actions and the clear rights violations when these powers by security agencies are used on individual people in the community. It is not just enough to speak out and oppose these legislations when they are put through and these powers when they are put through. We need to also be vocal when they are enacted and when they are used, and that is that is a challenging space to enter into, but one that I believe that we have the responsibility to do. We have a very important role to play in cutting through the propaganda and the anti-Chinese sentiment and highlighting the increasing dangers of aligning ourselves to a Trump US agenda. We also have a role in advocating for an independent approach to international relations and foreign policy that enables us to advocate a realistic approach to Australian-China relations that doesn't mean that every time we open our mouths to have that conversation, we're attacked as being fronts for the CCP. Because of what I look like and because of my last name, and I'll finish on this point, I worry about intervening in the Australia-China debate, and I don't think that is without good reason. I worry that if I don't exclusively focus on my human rights credentials and history and human rights abuses or the perils of Chinese influence, that I will be accused of doing the CCP's bidding, either by those who use the guise of human rights to hide their white saviour tendencies, or maybe by our security agencies when I open my door one morning. I worry that if I advocate in the party or even participate in a panel on China-Australia relations as I am today, that advocating for an independent foreign policy and for us to break our dangerous ties with the US and the Trump administration, that I will have my words taken out of context and I will find them used by white commentators and politicians to advance their own agendas. It's particularly offensive for me as a former employer of Amnesty International, employee of Amnesty International, to feel that I have to prove my credentials on standing up for persecuted groups by name checking experiences that I've had in this speech. I shouldn't have to say that since becoming an MP that I met with and showed public support for Tibetan MPs in exile. I shouldn't have to talk about the fact that I sat down and meet with Denise Ho, Hong Kong rock star and pro-democracy advocate, or join peaceful vigils for those who fled persecution in the as a result of the Chinese authorities. But I do have to say that 
because even those in our own party label me an apologist for a genocidal regime if I don't mention that every time I mention anything to do with China or Chinese people. The massive focus in our media and by our politicians across the political spectrum, ranging from one nation to our very own Green Party, on the threat from China is real. As well as the Australian government's exclusive focus on Chinese foreign influence is damaging to Australian communities here in Australia. It is also a significant barrier to achieving an independent foreign policy and a robust left position when it comes to how we deal with geopolitical realities of our times. As Greens, we need to make sure that we call this stuff out. We have a responsibility to make sure that we don't shy away from the complexities and we need to make sure that we have a proactively anti-racist approach to our foreign policy. Thank you so much for the opportunity and to be able to have this conversation today and I look forward to the discussion.